Bitcoin embodies the archetype of freedom and, and human beings um, at a core level desire freedom, whatever that freedom means to that person. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode from Big Guy. Today, we are interviewing Phil, one of the coolest plebs out there, most prolific pleb that I know out there. Uh, I came to know about his work when I learned about Simply Bitcoin, and uh, he was rocking it there. So, Phil, welcome, and we're glad to have a chat with you today. Man, I'm super humbled. I've never heard myself described by in any of those with any of those adjectives. Um, you know, usually, usually what comes to mind is goofy and and fool and stuff like that. So this is a total this is a total 180, uh, and I am deeply honored to uh, to be here, my friend. And should I should I call you because I I met you in TCBP as Sins. So uh, how would you like to me? Sina. How would you like me to refer to you? Sina. Yeah. Sina. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Like right, John Cena, dude, awesome. slightly different physique, but <laughs> that you get the you get the pronunciation. Cool. All right, yeah. Cena, that's perfect. So yeah, man. I mean, uh, uh, when I look at Simple Bitcoin, I was like, these guys are like doing this awesome thing, especially because we had just started uh, doing our our own podcast, and we kind of felt how difficult it is to be up to date, gather the news. Like even if you're reading a simple article, you have to pre prepare, spend a lot of time, you know, making sure you have your, uh, your thoughts in place and the flow is fine and everything. And you were covering news, you were covering big uh, memes, you were covering, you know, what everybody else said uh, and like great commentary on top of it. And, and then the production, you know, super cool and very uh, artistic. So, uh, kudos, kudos. Yeah, so there's there's a lot of pieces to this to uh, to break down, right? Um, so first of all, uh, in terms of production, in terms of editing, all of that, all of that is Nico. Okay, he is the one that uh, did and does all of the editing. And essentially, when it comes to putting together the uh, the news, right? So what we did was was that as you saw on Simply Bitcoin, um, we have it, uh, you know, we had it split up into several segments, right? We'd have the numbers, the fail, uh, the news, the meme review, software releases, like all these different segments. So what was happening was was that we, you know, we have like a Telegram group, and we we essentially do like brain dumps throughout the day because essentially we we both spend all of our time on Twitter and on social media. So we're constantly seeing all of this information from, from shit coins, from the central bankers, right? From the, the World Economic Forum, the IMF, like you're seeing all of this information. And, and what we're doing is, is that we're aggregating it. And that's, this was essentially the end result. And from that aggregation, we would figure out, okay, what's the story to choose? Now, the interesting part, I think that people, um, maybe didn't know or don't appreciate, um, or either, uh, is that we didn't, uh, we never would sync up what articles we were going to do. So Nico had no idea what quote unquote fail I was going to choose. And I had no idea what news he was going to cover. So oftentimes it ended up perfectly in sync, but other times so, like we would end up right before the show and it turned out Same that stuff. my fail segment, sorry, the same stuff maybe, right? Yes, my fail segment would end up being his new segment and vice versa. And right away we were like, okay, we need to pick something else up really, really quick. But um, all the commentary is, none of it is uh, planned or written out. Um, it, it was all always off the top of our heads. Uh, genuine reactions to, you know, to the actual you know, to the actual information at hand. So I, I think that that is, is part of the charm. And the other piece is, is that, uh, you know, we both, um, I think that we would both agree with this statement that we have excellent flow together. Um, it was something that we realized the first time we ever did a podcast together. Nico asked me to come on his, uh, join him on his podcast uh, before, so before Simply Bitcoin, he had a podcast and before Simply Bitcoin, I had a podcast. So he asked me to join him on his. We had really great back and forth. And so then I had him join me on mine. And again, you know, we had another great rip together. And it like we could see that there was like there's a great, you know, kind of like on screen chemistry. I, I could kind of, you know, he would make a specific type of comment and I would know to, you know, I, I knew how to pivot off of it. And he did the same thing. 
you know so we we had this good chemistry on uh, on screen and you know you put all these pieces together and it ends up making a pretty damn good show but all of that stuff that you're talking about right the smoothness of it and everything like that i mean besides us having the conversations it it's his editing right like he was the one that took care of the editing and i took care of the uh the other production pieces like putting together the descriptions and uh creating the uh, you know all the the little narratives if you actually went some people really do go through all the youtube descriptions and they can see you know th there was a specific description for the news a specific description for the fail listing all of our sources was very important finding the software releases putting together the memes right for the meme review so we worked very well hand in hand putting all these pieces together and and the end result was simply Bitcoin, you know? So it was, I, I mean, look, it was definitely like, you know, for me, it, it was, it was a lot of fun. I, I think for him also, it was a lot of fun. It still is. He still does it, right? He does it with Optimus now and they're totally killing it. And look, you know, like at, at the end of the day, that show is only going to continue to grow because they really are providing excellent signal and they're doing it in a way that Nico likes to say is easy to consume and that's very true. Yeah, yeah, product product of love. I recall watching the Steve Jobs interview when he was saying, you know, the only way you're gonna do great work is if you love it. So and it, and it's clear gotcha. that you guys are like super engaged and 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 enjoy the thing. And that also reminds me of Pump, who just recently stopped his live show saying, I hate the news, right? So that's super <laughs> super, super cool. I would hate the news too. I, I would definitely hate the news too if I was part of the machine that shilled a um, a dog shit product, right? Like that, that's awful. You know, BlockFi, I'm really sorry. Like this is something that the Bitcoin plebs have been, you know, have been calling out for a really long time. You know, when you move your Bitcoin, and I know that, you know, not that I want to go into the, the typical, you know, Bitcoin narratives that we all hear a million times, but look, it really is true. You know, it's corny, not your keys, not your coin. It, it, it's, it's legit. That is really what it is. And unfortunately, unfortunately, you only find this out when things go horribly wrong. You don't find out with like, ah, oh, this is a little bit of a mistake. Ah, oh, yeah, you know, it's just, it was just a light scratch. No, you find out when shit hits the fan. I'm sorry for, for uh, swearing, but that, that's what happens, right? You find out when things go horribly wrong and then you're like, oh God. Now I don't have any access to my funds. Now all of a sudden I'm stuck waiting for a bunch of legal procedures to take place. Like now all of a sudden your quote unquote hard earned Bitcoin is literally being treated the same way as the banking system treats our money. And anybody who has gone through trying to transfer large amounts in their, through, in their personal accounts through the banking system understands it is not your money you are asking for permission every single time you want to use it. Hey, listen, you know, 500 bucks, a thousand bucks, no problem. You transfer that. You're all good. Once you start getting into the 10 K's, the 15s, the twenties, fifties, uh, it's not your money. <laughs> it's not your money. It's, and, it's all, and you find out. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all this recency bias. People are like, yeah, I put my money in there. I spend, you know, a couple months and they were paid. They, they've been, good to me nothing happened i haven't heard of any bad news but the problem is bad news happens when it's too late right so you gotta you gotta think about this situation where you have no time to react because they're not going to tell you hey we are having problems it's gonna be known to the public when it's already late and a lot of people are like you know they just rely on on the signals that are around them i'm not hearing any bad news from this company so it must be legit i remember you know talking to one of my friends uh about like something like more than a year ago and he was looking into celsius and uh he asked me oh this company is giving me really good uh rates and uh nice gains i looked at the website and i was like you know there's no clear discussion of rei publication and this really looks scammy stay away you know small company um and he, I guess he listened to me a year later, I sent him the, the news. <laughs> so he was like, yeah, man, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So, you know, you don't, you don't send some of these, especially if you're not in the space, if you haven't been in the space for some, some time to you know, pick up the signals of, uh, you know, scammy versus, you know, more legit businesses. 
Um, that's how, like, for example, people like Corey picked up the the signal from Do Kwan, right? He, I actually was in, in conversations when, when I saw his tweet, he said, uh, Elizabeth Holmes vibes. And I then wrote, yeah, exactly. I felt the same thing in a Telegram group. And then, yeah, sh soon enough, uh, you know, whenever, whenever it smells funny, there is something going on. So people have to be a little bit more careful. You know, the Celsius thing was really interesting because if you know, if you know a little bit about, okay, so I'm going to back up. Okay. In 2018, I think it was mid 2018, 2019, I saw an interview um, or I listened to an interview with Alex Mashinsky, right? Who's the CEO of Celsius. And, and I was, uh, I was completely amazed. I was like, wow, this, this guy's legit. Now, why did I think this guy was legit? Thought he was legit because he was one of the people accredited with creating the voice over IP protocol, which nobody freaking uses. Nobody needs it. Anyways, I digress. But, but, back, but back in the day when voice over IP came out, okay, I remember there was a company in, in, in the, um, I remember there was a company called Vonage, Okay. And Vonage was selling voice over IP. Now only, I think like only Gen Xers are going to remember Vonage. Okay. But Jim Cramer, one of the few times he got something right. Okay. He used to call it Vonage the dog. Okay. And, and it's because all it did was just lose money, right? Like nobody cared about voice over IP. The internet was continually growing and the people that were in the know realized, Hey, wait a second. We don't need voice over IP. There, there's already all of this data going back and forth. You don't need this separate protocol. <laughs> you don't need any of this. But anyways, but anyways, right? You fast forward to 2018 and you have this guy who's very well spoken, right? Very positive, enthusiastic, created the voice over IP protocol. He's not an idiot, right? He's not an idiot. So you're sitting there and you're like, this guy makes sense. This guy's legit. So I took a look at Celsius back then, and I was just beginning. I, I had just gotten wrecked on all my shit coins, okay? I had just dumped them out, and I had turned everything into what it should have been from the beginning, which was Bitcoin. And I was like, well, what if I take a bit of it, and I just put it into this Celsius platform? You know, just take a bit, right? Like, not even a full Bitcoin, you know? Like, let's let, let's do, like, uh, you know, 25% of a Bitcoin. And, and this is what happens, right? My stupid monkey brain, Okay. So I go and I move 25% of a Bitcoin to the Celsius platform. At the time, they didn't have shitcoining. In no way does that validate my stupid move, okay? I'm just saying, to set the stage, they did not have their shitcoin yet. There was no sell token yet. They weren't providing anything else. It was just stick your Bitcoin here and we are going to pay you. We're going to pay you out weekly for, you know, you storing your Bitcoin on this platform. So anyways, um, so I, I go and I put my 25%. <laughs> And and this is what happens with the monkey brain. You you wait a week or two and you see what your return is. And you say, well, logically, I could just double that by putting double the amount of Bitcoin. Exactly. So now you're up to 50. So now I'm up to 50% of a Bitcoin, right? And, and of why course, not? why not, right? And and it's legit <laughs> and it's safe. So now three months later, okay, uh, with you know, without divulging the real number of Bitcoin that I had on that thing, you know, like let's say I'm at like, you know one and a half, two Bitcoin, you know, like sitting on this thing and you don't realize what you just did. You don't even realize it. And so all of a sudden I stop and I'm like, wait a second. I'm like, this is the complete opposite. This was the whole reason I got out of shit coining. This is a scam. These people can rug pull. And now I've lost everything that I've saved for the last two years, all because I'm trying to get this tiny little percentage. So naturally, I took everything out of Celsius once it really hit me. Um, and I just kept watching, right? Just kept watching Celsius. And then all of a sudden, they come out with their cell token. And I swear, as soon as I saw that, I was like, I did the right move. Finally, finally, I, I like, I did the right thing. I'm not going to get screwed. I'm not going to get rug pulled because my money's not there anymore. Because for me, like, that was the red flag. If, if they're making, listen, if they actually had a legitimate way of making money with your Bitcoin, without rehypothecating it, without doing some background magic, 
Why do they need a token? Why do they need a shitcoin out of thin air? And this is what nobody seems to understand, like, or not nobody, but, you know, the, the people that want to buy into the shitcoin narrative. It's that, hey, you know, they're creating this out of nothing. Like, I've said this on Simply Bitcoin a thousand times, and I'll say it again. Um, you know, when, when I first got into this, it cost like 25 bucks to make a shitcoin. And I knew some other people who were minting shitcoins for less than that. You can, and, and you pick, you pick the qualities that you want. You pick the emission, you pick the max cap, you, you pick all this stuff. It's a scam. And then after that, what do you think it costs to market this crap? Right? So it, it, there is no skin in the game. There is no proof of work when creating a shit coin. So literally he created something out of nothing and then had a whole bunch of marketing money to market themselves. And how did they market themselves? They got into Bitcoin mining, right? Like that was one of their stupid things. They got into Bitcoin mining. And again, you we always have to zoom out, look at the perception. What is the story that they're telling us? We're a Bitcoin company, even though we're not, okay? Even though we have this shit coin that, that we pump, we're a Bitcoin company and we invest in Bitcoin and Bitcoin is legitimate. So what does that do? That lends credibility and it lends the validity to their platform. Even without it being valid, it doesn't need to be because Bitcoin's over here. So we're, we're all good because we see Bitcoin. Absolutely. But it was just, it was, you know, and then the thing just freaking falls apart naturally. But what does it take for it to fall apart? It takes the market dump, right? It takes the tide to pull back to show everyone who's swimming naked. Celsius was swimming naked with BlockFi, which is kind of gross. <laughs> yeah, that's the psychology of every uh, Ponzi scheme, right? It, it everything is happy, everything is great, everybody's happy, and uh, you know, so so you don't necessarily feel anything is wrong when when it when it's paying and when it's growing. You only realize it when the tide has gone down and uh, music has has stopped, which uh, always happens. So so if somebody is able to you know, jump on these uh, Ponzi's early may be good for them, but um, the majority of people will be late and uh, end up being the backholder. So, you know, initially when I was seeing, you know, this casino, my, my thought was that, you know, there's so many things you want to do in life. My time is valuable. So uh, if something is like 99.9% .9 scammy, I will just cross the whole field I don't even bother with any of that shit. I will focus 100% on Bitcoin and physical Bitcoin, not none of that, you know, yield generating products or anything. Especially because, you know, I teach business, right? And then I always ask my, myself, where is that 20% coming from? And that that's what that's also something I ask my friend. You know, how the hell are these guys generating 20%, 10% on on the funds? If you don't know where that's coming from, it's probably coming from nowhere. I mean, just just Ponzi behavior uh, made out of thin air, and it's it's just uh, it's it's a tool to lure in more suckers, right? Uh, anything that I don't understand, how it creates value in the real world, right? I don't trust it. That's my rule. I I, I couldn't agree. I look, I I couldn't agree more. And and that's you know, th this is exactly the point, right? People, <clears throat> you know, we want to believe. I think that's also part of it, right? Like this is this is also, I, I mean, I remember when I was shitcoining and I would read these white papers, I wanted to believe. And, and don't think for a second that Bernie Madoff's customers, they didn't want to believe. They absolutely wanted to believe. And if we talk about, you know, businesses that went under and screwed people, you know, you take a look at companies like WorldCom or a better example would be Briex, okay? A lot of people wouldn't remember Briex. Briex was a gold miner, okay? And they claim to have so much gold. And everybody wants to believe it. So you invest. That's what it is. You want to believe. But the problem is, is that when the fundamentals aren't actually there, then it all just falls away like sand, right? It, it just completely falls away. It cannot hold the weight of the structure that's been created on top of it, which is exactly what we saw with Celsius, exactly what we saw with BlockFi. And, and, and the whole thing just crumbles away. And then there's, I, I know there's like three or four other players that I'm not even remembering right now that, that just completely cratered. Um, but again, it's because the foundation wasn't there. You know, these people, they're not actually building what they say they're building. 
So when you actually go and take a look and you, like you said, where do they generate this yield from? Where is it coming from? Is it sustainable? This is something also Alan Farrington uh, explains very well too. He's like, you know, the goal of finance is not just to move numbers and move money around and multiply this by that and repackage these loans and then create this financial product. And it's not it's not about any of that. It, it's about supporting uh, business. It's about, you know, greasing the wheels of commerce. Any other part of it is just playing with numbers. And when it's done too much, uh, then it creates bubbles and bubbles uh bubbles grow and grow and grow and then catastrophically uh, blow up. And the problem is like all the way up, you are being ridiculed for being this, you know, old fashioned guy who doesn't want to join the um, successful trend and miss out on the, on these huge gains. And yeah, but uh, unfortunately they all stupid. the same way. Exactly. We're stupid. We don't understand the innovation. Okay, like this is I can't tell you how many times I can't tell you how many shit coiners have said have said to me, you're lazy and you don't understand the technology. No, no, it's not that we're lazy. It's that we actually figured out that this technology does not need to be money on its own. I look the one one of the things, right, is I've, I've always asked this before. Why doesn't SQL have its own money? Why doesn't SQL have its own money? It doesn't need to be money. And that technology can stand on its own as a product that is worthwhile, that people are willing to pay for, and they get value out of it. It doesn't need to be money. This, the technology stands on its own. But if you have technology that doesn't stand on its own, it has one, less, it has one, one thing left to do. Try to lure unsuspecting investors into thinking that it's an investment or it's a way to store your wealth or something like that. Like I, I remember the, I remember the, 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 the Winklevi thing, um, the, the, the twins, they, they were, they were, I, I think it was file coin could have been file coin. I don't remember, but it was one of those file storage. This thing's going to be huge, massive boom. You know, like it's, it's got all the features, all this stuff. Can't you just have the file storage and pay somebody in whatever, currency that they currently want they may choose bitcoin they may choose their local currency but in no way does it need a token in no way does it need to be its own money and once you start dismantling the use cases like that first of all everything from 2017 and before disappears in the flash of an eye like the, the blink of an eye it just all disappears because okay those are all crap so now the next thing is and this goes back to something you said before okay about for, that alan farrington explained OK, where it's not just about moving numbers around. That's what DeFi is. OK, that is exactly because a lot of I've had people come back to me and say, well, you need the token for DeFi to work. Ah, yes, you do need the token for DeFi to work. But guess what? DeFi isn't actually doing anything. Everybody that joins the ecosystem is the liquidity. It is liquidity for the sake of liquidity and nothing else. It literally does nothing else. It's numbers change and that's it. And if you are the unfortunate sucker left holding the bag, ah, well, that's it. You know, like you said before, the music stopped and you didn't have a chair. So fuck you. You know, like that's it. You're done. And that's exactly what we saw. So we saw one rug pull after another. Now, another thing that I saw, I thought was funny. Um, because we're talking because the second you mentioned shitcoining and DeFi and stuff, I, I can't help myself. The other thing that I that, that I noticed once all these liquidity pools, once people caught on to the liquidity pool scam, which still is happening, um, I feel that the scammers moved away from the pool and they they started doing it on the bridge, right? So like, I, I feel like it's like a small town of scamming, right? We were scamming you in the pool. Now you figured out that the pool is dangerous. So we're going to start scamming you back at the bridge where you're not expecting it, right? And this is essentially the bridge is where all the the magic happens, you know, where the tokens get swapped and all this stuff. And again, why are we swapping these tokens? So you got what? so you got, you know, 10,000 tokens and then you can, you know, put more your money in them and then put them somewhere else to generate yield and whatever and then you can take the yield and put somewhere else to 
then borrow a few other coins and then those coins are staked at this other place and it all ends up being circular and you know none of this gambling would be a problem if it actually did something useful for the economy outside the ecosystem but it it's all circular one helping the other the other helping this this is pumping because the other one is pumping and vice versa I mean, I tried, honestly, I did try to think about, you know, these use cases. I I actually did the first uh, exposure I had to Bitcoin was like in 2015 or so when I was studying supply chain management. And then I figured out uh, there's this new thing coming um, like uh, blockchain in supply chains. And the idea was that, oh, this is going to allow us to share data across companies and help, you know, collaborations and all kinds of things. Um I've been following that for several years. And first of all, nothing useful has come out. Several teams, lots of investment has been has been uh, uh, done here. And uh, what they came up with is just a fancier database. And one day in, in a conference related to this, I talked to a few engineers, hey, how is this different from a regular centralized database? They're like, not much, but calling it blockchain helps because it convinces management that this is new. This is a new initiative, and then it sells well. It's good advertisement and brings people, um, you know, together to talk about sharing data. <laughs> so the blockchain does nothing actually underneath, right? And then more recently, past couple of years, uh, the the projects are actually getting defunded and closed, and the companies are like, "Yeah, we we've played with this enough. Nothing's coming out of this that's really making money." So uh, that's just one example that I've been you know closely following. And then you the the asset test is asking yourself how this thing is generating more value in the world. And if not, it's just, you know, playing with finance. That's why finance is so uh, profitable. That's why in every downtown you go, the biggest buildings are banks. And that always amazes me. You go to this, you know, shitty town, super small, nothing's happening. And then there's a huge, huge building, a skyscraper that belongs to a financial institution. That's because these guys have figured out a way to just play with numbers and then uh, benefit a little bit out of every single transaction, every single movement. Uh, and they actually said, uh, I, I remember the quote, I forgot who was it, but the quote is, it's, you know, finance is like sitting at that tight part on an hourglass, right? So mo you, you find yourself a position where most of the economic activity is going through you, you and you take a cut of everything and it, it multiplies, it adds up, it adds up. And then you, the beauty of it is you don't have to do anything. You don't have to produce anything. You just... Placing yourself in a, in a position, uh, it's kind of a monopoly, right? It's seniorage power. Um, and that's, and that's you know, a huge waste of money. So, but unfortunately, it's not going away anytime soon. Unless, and actually, one of our, one of our hopes is, you know, Bitcoin is probably going to put a cap on all these uh, shenanigans, right? Once you have your money, once you have a simple way to store, you don't have to rely on 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 the financial institutions to be the gateway between your your money and your future wealth, right? They have, you know, made themselves these experts who have to guide you in in keeping the value of your money. Like Saifedean says, you earn your money twice. You earn it first, but then you have to protect it protect it against inflation. And to right. do that, you have to be a hedge fund manager, you know, pay this financial advisor and pay that bank and then follow the reports by that, you know, expert in macro and whatever, this and that, just to earn a little bit. And at the end of the year, you will probably underperform inflation and be happy about it. That's exactly right. And I just want to go back to, to a point that you made earlier on about the supply chains, because so... I, I was one of those people who was very attracted to the supply chain tokens, okay? At the beginning, I was like, so for me, my, my big thing was supply chain tokens and um, uh, privacy, privacy coins, okay? Um, 
Wow. And and multi technology coins, right? Like we're gonna go back in time to stuff like Verge, right? With the with the five algorithms and and all of this stuff that is complete nonsense. But anyways, going back to the supply chains, okay? So first of all, when companies share information, what a lot of people don't understand is there is a lot of regulation with data. Okay. Um, I worked for a security company, more specifically an access control company. So we had customers that would send us databases. These databases contained extremely sensitive personal information. Okay. We had very strict rules on how to handle this data, how to destroy this data. We, I mean, th there were checks and balances all over the place. Let me tell you something. Blockchain ain't fixing that shit. Okay. So you, so you weren't happening. sending it, you weren't sending the data to 10,000 nodes around the world, right? No, we, we were not. Exactly. <laughs> the data was centralized because it was easy to control this one central point. Okay. So the data was centralized and the best part of it, this data did not need to be money. I, I know it sounds like a shocker, but it did not need to have a token to provide the function that we needed. And it didn't also need to be money to provide the function for the customer, right? We, it just, it didn't need to be money. And that's, that's the whole piece of it. And, you know, at, going back to, you know, the, the, the supply chain piece, you realize, you know, why does it need to be money? It doesn't, but what does it need to do? It needs to provide the technical function that I need, which is passing data back and forth, which in no way requires decentralization in in no way does it require censorship resistance from the government and it sure as hell doesn't need to be a store of value so why does it need to be money why does it need to try to be money why is it being marketed to me as some form of investment and or money again right it's incentives you have somebody who is incentivized to market it to you this way because they are going to become exceedingly wealthy off of your, our poor decision-making. It's plain and simple. It's like, you know, I, I know that sometimes you, you hear from the no coiners that, you know, Bitcoin is the greater fool theory. Um, I definitely don't agree that Bitcoin is the greater fool theory, but I, or part of it, but I definitely agree that shitcoining and all of its forms are part of the greater fool theory because they are definitely projects and technology parading around as Bitcoin or is trying to be better than Bitcoin. And it's just not true. They fall apart on every single, you know, we always talk about the trade-offs. The trade-offs are very important with every single one of these shit coins. You are trading off. We are trading off the most important qualities of Bitcoin. Why would you do that when all you did was come here, right, to store your time in the best way possible? That, literally, that, that, that's what we, and if we, if we stop and think, why did I come here? That, that alone should start the wheel spinning and, and, and you start to take a look, take an honest look at these shitcoin projects and say to yourself, why am I holding this bag? You know, like, don't get me wrong, but, you know, one of my best friends, which I know this is going to sound terrible, but, you know, one of my best friends, a hardcore shitcoiner, you know, and like, I can't, I have tried, man, I have done everything I can to get him not to shitcoin or to get him to dump out everything in, into BTC. He won't do it. He's been holding on to bags for four years. Okay. Bags that are worth less today than they were then. Nobody is, nobody is turning this stuff into money. Everyone used it as a gimmick. Like people do not understand. And, and then, and then of course you get the, which, which I think is hilarious. This, this, oh, lower your time preference with shit coins. Listen, the, the narratives I actually tweeted this out today. The Bitcoin narratives don't work for <laughs> shit coins. Like you can't just, yeah, exactly. Like you, you can't just sit there and be like, oh yeah, you know, it's, it's going nowhere. There's no adoption. There's no proof of work. There's nothing securing the network. I just need to lower my time preference. Listen, they need you to believe this narrative. The marketers need you to believe this so that they can continue to kick the can down the road and get other people, newer people, to drop their new money into this old crap. So, you Anyways. know, people came to Bitcoin to find a better way to save their money and their time. And also to put a cap or kind of a revolt against 
irresponsible money printing and this centralized control over money, you know, these days we hear about FOMC kind of driving the whole movements in the markets. It's it's such a stupid thing, you know, a small group of men, I mean, men and women, uh, gather and make decisions that impact the whole world. And uh, they make mistakes often. They don't have the capacity to absorb all this stuff that are happening. So these are the things that, you know, people can cause people to believe in Bitcoin. But now that we are in Bitcoin, <laughs> everybody has started in, in the broader crypto space, everybody has started to create their own printer. So everybody's now a Fed. And also people, instead of you know saving your time and, and going out there and enjoying your life, people have started to become gamblers, you know, dealing with price uh, pumps and dumps and uh, this coin is better, that white paper is awesome, this technology is going to take over. And uh, basically, any anything you wanted Bitcoin to do is being undone by this whole casino. Uh, it's a it's a huge huge mess and such a waste of time. I would like to ignore it, but every time I'm like, damn, this is this is such a disaster for the society. It's a massive distraction. It is a massive distraction away from Bitcoin. Don't get me wrong; it is a fantastic plot for slowing down Bitcoin adoption. Okay, if we take a look at the narratives and the, you know, the the different reasons, uh, the different ways that Bitcoin is being attacked, it's fantastic because it gets you to throw your money. It gets you to throw bad money into even worse projects, which it, it's just it's mind boggling. And and it's the the problem is this, right? We're all Keynesians at, at, at heart, right? We're, we, we've all been brainwashed. I mean, look, I, I grew up in Montreal. I grew up in Canada. Um, I was taught. Uh, I, I, was, I was told, right? Like we, we, we aren't given a decision. We aren't taught Austrian economics and uh, Keynesian economics. And then they tell you, which one's better? You know, like, which do you think is better? No, that's not how it's explained to you. It's explained to you that, you know, it, it's... We're, we're following the Keynesian philosophy. The government handles the money printer. They are competent. They are the entity that is entrusted with the money printing. Now, it's again, we, we go through this. It's, it's always about the storytelling, right? It's always about the narrative. You always have to think like, what, what, do they, what are they trying to get me to believe? And we have to believe that incompetent human beings, because... I'm sorry. We're we're you know human stupidity is infinite. I you know I'm not saying that every single one of us is stupid, but every single one of us can be stupid. Okay? So to imagine that we magically take on a job with the government and become not stupid and become altruistic and amazing at making decisions for society as a whole just because you are now government. It's not what happens. It's not what happens at all. Just a bunch of stupid people in great positions that now have zero accountability to anyone. Okay, there's. I, I think it, it's going to sound out of place, but it always reminds me. Um, there's a fantastic line out of out of out of Ghostbusters. Okay, when right at the beginning, when they get fired. Okay, and they come out. They they come outside, and you know one and. Uh, I think it's uh, Bill Murray, or I don't remember who it is that that looks at him, and he goes, he goes, you've never, he goes, you've never been in the private sector. They expect results, okay? <laughs> because it's in the public sector, this you don't awesome. ever have to come up with anything, and that's exactly it, right? Like you can see, I, I honestly feel that, unfortunately, there's a lot of people that go into government specific for, they they go into government for. The fact that there's no accountability. You can screw that up as bad as you want. It's never your, you are never going to be held accountable. So it, it just really scares me. And and just to finish on that point, there was a, a tweet today with um, a clip with Jim Bullard, I think it is. From 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 the Fed or anyways, he was on MSNBC and and he he laughingly jokingly says, "What well, what's the matter? You don't trust us?" Like. Are are you kidding me? <sighs> like, they yeah. they are gaslighting us, and and just to uh, to circle back, the reason why I was explaining this is is that we've all been brainwashed with this Keynesianism. So the idea that a shitcoin can come along and they can just 
print as much as they want and create their own rules. So many of us don't even question the validity. We just look at it and say, okay, well, let's see what features it has. It's like, what? It doesn't matter what features it has. They can all be changed. They're not constant. They don't, they, they have no lasting power. There's no staying power. There's, there, there's no way of actually, there's no way beyond the shadow of a doubt of guaranteeing that you can store your value in this. This is what people don't understand about the Bitcoin network. So, I'm sorry, you were gonna you were gonna say something about Keynesianism. Yeah, I mean, this is exactly like you said, this is a huge uh, you know, psyop brainwashing. I've taken, you know, lots of economics classes and different things here and there, different institutions, different places. No one ever mentions like there's a you know, inflation can not be there, or like they, they start assuming that we have this government who runs monetary policy and that's just given that's there. And then the only question is what monetary policy is better and uh, how it should be conducted. How, how can we change the value of money in the, in the most optimal way. And then I've, when you actually try to do some economics research, you have to consider all the complexities that are in the world. So you try to build a model that explains the future of, uh, you know, the interest rates or the, the GDP growth and that kind of stuff, you include all the real things and your model becomes so complicated that no one can solve it. Okay, so you don't have a paper, you don't get tenure. The next thing you do is you make simplifying assumptions. So you you basically assume away all the real stuff, all the dynamics, all the second order, third order effects, all the complex things, human behavior. It's extremely, you know, hard to predict. Assume that all the way. And then you still have a huge mathematical model that you know takes one or two years of a really intelligent person focusing on it and wasting their life on to come up with some elaborate uh, 10 pages of Greek letters and looks cool, looks awesome. No one else understands, you know, everyone in business who, who actually is in touch with reality would laugh at this shit. But it's science, you know, it's science. And and it gets published and you get tenure. And, and no one, you don't care if anyone is using the bullshit that you just published. Because the incentives are, uh, you you simply produce. You, you don't care if it's being used. Your money, your, your, your salary is coming from either, you know, public institutions or for instance, if you're an economist, a huge chunk of economists are hired by the Fed. So that's kind of a, you know, a feedback loop that promotes that, that helps people keep doing the stuff that, uh, you know, have been uh, doing the stuff that are uh, the orthodoxy, the, the, the common beliefs. And especially if you do, if you write a paper that says, yeah, this monetary policy doesn't really make sense. It has all these problems. And people are like, yeah, so many people are saying, this is the way. And who are you to question that? Your papers don't get published. You can't really say anything against the belief, the common belief of the field, right? So you you would generally, the safest way to publish is making incremental changes that look cool, but really, you know, go with the narrative. Questioning big narratives is not going to get you tenure. That's so so at least if you want to do that, or if you if you're strong enough to to uh, make really strong arguments again about it, you've got to wait until you have a super firm uh, position. And uh, most people don't don't even bother. Let's just go with the flow and and see what happens. That's how you know you spend uh, lots of energy by by lots of smart people, but all of that goes to waste. And and like you said, no one no one questions uh, no one questions it, and that becomes the material that we use to to train new students who go out and become um, these talking heads around the world, um, and and uh, that's how you get some of these super, super basic questions about money go unanswered for decades, even though that's actually the source of a lot of the predicaments we have in our in how our economy functions and then how our society works and all and and, and a lot of our so social problems. 
So yeah, that's like you said, you know, you hear something from one place, but then you also hear it echoed from a ton of other places. Media says the same thing. Book says the same thing. Professor says the same thing. Friend says the same thing. And no one questions it. And you should be a super extraordinary human being to be put in that environment and still be able to question those basic premises. You know, that's, that's extremely hard. Oh, I, I complete, I completely agree. And I, I just want to add, um, tinfoil hat time, right? Um, if you can fool people into thinking that they're doing something worthwhile, right? Then they're going to continue to do it. And it may be worthwhile to a very small group of people who are amassing, um, power and are essentially purchasing a country for pennies on the dollar. Yes, it's fantastic for them. But in terms of the greater good, in terms of, you know, each individual human being and personal responsibility, um, they're not really producing anything of value. But the thing is, it's not and I it it gets a little bit difficult, right? Because it's not so cut and dry. But the point I'm trying to make is, is that we've almost been fooled out of actually being humans. Okay, we've actually been tricked out of being humans with our shitty money and the structures that have been created with this shitty money. And so therefore, everyone's incentives are to keep this particular structure built with shitty money going. So it, it becomes incredibly difficult to, to fight that narrative or to see outside of it. And anybody looking outside of it obviously comes across as completely insane. So you look at these in very intelligent people, very, you know, very well educated. And what, you know, it's like, what are they being educated in? You know, the like, if you take a look at the investment houses like JP Morgan, right? They're hiring mathematicians, mathematicians that could be doing most likely much more valuable work for themselves and humanity. But the incentives are they should be working at JP Morgan. You know, like that, that's, that's what it is. That's scary shit. Like we've been tricked and people do not see the hoodwink. How can you look, I, I go to do this amazing. I have this amazing profession. I make amazing money. I've got this giant house. We've got all this useless crap that, you know, makes us happy on the moment when we buy it. But then after that, there's layers of depression that set in that nobody talks about. We have a schooling system that doesn't teach any human beings uh, about uh, essentially basic, you know, basic things like anxiety, flight or fight responses, stuff like that. So you have all these human beings wandering around with just a whole bunch of growing and ballooning psychological problems. And then you throw in the shitty money with the feelings of worthlessness and stuff like that. I mean, don't get me wrong, but like, like I said, it's a tinfoil hat moment. People do not see the interconnectedness of all of these things, okay? All of this is interconnected, and this is why we say Bitcoin fixes this. We're not saying that it's, you know, uh, uh, an answer to all questions, but if we fix the money, then we can have a chance at fixing the structures that are built on top of that money. And since we use money for everything, suffice it to say, it's going to fix all those structures. <laughs> so, I mean, but hey, we'll we'll see. You know, you know, and what's really exciting to me is uh, Bitcoin became this magnet where uh, people who think differently got attracted to it. People who thought we could actually move outside of the the box that's being defined for us. And uh, just following, you know, Bitcoiners on social media and other places, you, you can feel that there's a lot of uh, people who are, you know, strong critical thinkers uh, who are not afraid of challenging the status quo, who are not afraid of, you know, calling bullshit on bullshit and, and not going with the crowd. That's what I really like. So, you know, you, in you initially think money is this cold hard thing that's uh you know it's just accounting and it doesn't really matter for uh you know for the fundamentals of how society works and all but just seeing such a rich culture and community get built around 
money that's supposed to be neutral and apolitical and uh, just, you know, a bunch of data points on a database, right? On a distributed database. Um, this is amazing to me. And this is a huge, huge phenomena. And, 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 and one of the ways I would think about you and your work is, you know, uh, and maybe the club movement is contributions to this culture. So uh, I'd like to pick your brain a little bit on what you think of this whole Bitcoin culture and club movement and basically what it wants and what it, uh, what it says, uh, particularly for someone who's new to all this. Okay. So, I mean, I, I mean, I'm probably going to ruffle some feathers on this one. Um, so I like the way that you word it. I like the fact that you word it as culture. Um, I do not believe that, um, I, I used to think this, I used to think that there was a quote unquote community once upon a time, there is no community. Um, it's a network. It's, it's a network of people, um, that people can voluntarily, uh, join or leave. That being said, that being said, okay. Bitcoin is the shelling point. So what ends up happening is exactly what you mentioned at the beginning. There's it, it ended up attracting the people that think differently the people that think outside the box, the people that think, you know what, maybe this could work and and why not? And why shouldn't we give it a chance? So it attracts these kind of um, grassroots type of thinkers and, and, and people, just grassroots people. Um, and something that I think that is different in Bitcoin that I've never seen in traditional money because traditional money, I've, I've never, I've never really given a shit. Um, you know, like, it's like, yeah, you have to earn money. Yeah. You know, you got to figure out how to invest it. Yeah. You got to figure out how to accumulate it. Yeah. You got to figure out how to sustain yourself with it. It, it never captured like money doesn't really capture your hearts and minds, but something that's very interesting about Bitcoin is this underlying philosophy, right? The proof of work the value proposition, the, the censorship resistance, like all of this is at a much deeper level, right? Like human beings, we have these like inherent archetypes, uh, you know, for example, the battle of good and evil, like there, there's a reason why movies like Star Wars do so well. There, there's a reason why Lord of the Rings does so well. Like people sit there and they're like, oh, wow, yeah, it's just great movie making. It's because the, the people that, that wrote these stories understood the archetypes, Right. And, and we have these things, this battle of good and evil, you know, that, that that's kind of in us. Right. Light and darkness and, and all of these human beings, whether we want to accept it or not, has nothing to do with religion. OK, we are dualistic in nature, whether we want to accept it or not. OK, there's a hot and cold. There's a positive and feminine. There's all this stuff that goes on and nobody really talks about it. But anyways, that's not really that, that's not really the focus of it. My my point is, is that. Bitcoin embodies the archetype of freedom and, and human beings um, at a core level desire freedom, whatever that freedom means to that person, okay? Whatever it means to that person, whatever it means to that group. Like for me personally, freedom doesn't mean um, having yachts or, uh, you know, having my own tennis court or anything like that. Like I don't give a shit about these things. Like these things are irrelevant to me. Freedom to me means freedom of time. I get to choose what I want to do with my time. And Bitcoin is a base layer that helps enable that archetype, the archetype of freedom through money, through our, you know, through our value transfer. Now, the plebs, right? If we're going to talk about the, the pleb movement, so everybody, so... It's kind of funny, right? Like uh, Pirate Beach Bum is kind of the the person who who started a few years ago, uh, the uh, the the pleb thing, and and of course I think that he can explain it much better. So any explanation I can really give about the history is going to pale in comparison to his. So you got to get him on. Um, but anyways, uh, besides that, what what I do want to say about the plebs is is that um, it, it's really just anyone and 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 everyone to the to the extent that. A person is truly being themselves. And if this person is truly being themselves and they're, they're not here to, you know, to be a part of the, you know, the circle jerk and they're, they're not trying to sit there and, you know, milk the Bitcoiners and stuff like that. Like if they are genuinely here for Bitcoin, then indeed they are plebs, you know, like I know that Mr. Hoddle doesn't think of himself as a pleb, but unfortunately he is 
because he does yeah. a great job of battling for Bitcoin. And I know if he actually watches this show, he's going to be like, oh, fuck this guy. He's like, call me a pleb. He's like the king pleb, you know, and we love Mr. Hoddle. But that's the point, right? Like these guys, like they don't realize it. It's like you're standing up for Bitcoin. You are standing up for something outside of yourself. OK, something and, and something that is is genuinely outside of yourself, that is not controlled by a central entity that cannot be changed by a very small group of people or an individual. This means a lot. There's many humans, right? Because, look, don't get me wrong, but on this plane, right, on this material plane, we are inherently separate, right? You are separate from me. I'm separate from you. We're all separate from everybody else. Well, so that brings in a certain degree of selfishness. Whether we want to accept it or not, every single human being is selfish. We're all selfish, right? Because at the end, there's an I. Bitcoin allows us to, to really have our cake and eat it too. It, it allows us to be selfish. It allows us to be selfish. It allows us to be greedy. And it allows us to use our selfish, greedy incentives to do something better for everyone. And that doing something better for everyone is the adoption of Bitcoin and hyper Bitcoinization. So, you know, like I, I'm going to say that, you know, the, the, again, the, the plebs it, it's, it's about being here for Bitcoin. That Absolutely. to me is you, really, you made, a, you made a fantastic point. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I kind of, in my mind, uh, I kind of tend to differentiate between two groups, plebs, and then something what I call fiat bitcoiners or kind of i don't know you can also call it fake bitcoiners and this is something yep. you, you just have to feel i mean there's no there's no rule but you kind of know when someone is in it for the money and the fame and and the branding and building a business to cash out or somebody who's in it for bitcoin uh, and that's that's how i basically differentiate uh basically draw my line and, and mm -hmm. it's super clear to me. I mean, when I mean, I look at some of these simps um, on Twitter, basically, you know, doing everything they can to accumulate more followers and celebrate. Oh, I got to 10,000 today. Let's get to 20,000. Um, and then they all follow the same business model, right? You know, circle jerk talks, say something good, good about somebody else in a very selfish and, and pathetic manner to attract them to you. So they say good things about you. And then you send each other's followers and then everything is kumbaya and you get invited on that podcast. They get invited on yours. And, and then you turn this into a club of insiders. So you guys now are the overlord. You, you control the, the, the thought space your word is getting amplified. That's how social media works. You have to get amplified. So then you have to, you know, find partners who are big enough. And that's what really puts me off. I, I just hate this, um, these behavior, especially, you know, pandering to someone just because they have a platform. And does it matter if they have a mind? Does it matter if they are saying anything intelligent? If you have a platform, you get uh, invited and you get valued. And this is horrible. And and that's why I love clubs a lot. Yeah, I, I I totally agree. And and I just wanted to throw in a little piece of history. Um, so one of the one of the reasons that the whole pleb thing was started was because so so like when I first got into Bitcoin, you got in in 2015. I got in in like late 2016, but I was using it for medium of exchange, and then I became a total shitcoiner in 2017, 2018. But besides that, okay. Um, when I first got in and I first found Bitcoin Twitter, okay, so first for me, it was crypto Twitter. I'm so sorry for saying that, but that's what it was until I realized it was only Bitcoin, okay? And, and I noticed these, these big accounts were like setting the narrative. You know what I mean? Like accounts like, uh, you know, like Dan Held, you know, and like Peter McCormack and, you know, even like people like Pomp and stuff like that. You know, it's like these big accounts, you know, Jason Williams, you know, they'd come in. It's like everybody else, Nick Carter, you know, they, they'd come in. Everybody else would have their opinions and then these guys would go and post, you know, their response and then boom. You get like, you know, they would no. ratio the original poster and it was just like all about what they were setting the narrative. OK, we are the talking heads of the space and we are setting the narrative. It's like so I, I'm a child of the 80s. I'm a Gen Xer. OK, uh, I grew up before skateboarding was cool. I've brought this up a million times. Skateboarding and snowboarding, all that stuff was not cool. You were just some, you know, some trash idiot playing on a board and 
You're, you're never going to amount to anything anyways, and you're wasting your time. Well, I saw a whole bunch of people wasting their time growing, grow it into a multi-billion dollar industry, okay, which fed a whole lot of people. And you know what? Skateboarding ended up taking a lot of kids off the streets, stopped a lot of kids from doing drugs, doing crime and stuff like that. And then they found themselves in, in, in a passion. Now, obviously, Bitcoin is way bigger than skateboarding. Um, but what I'm trying to explain is the grassroots movement of it, okay? Now, who actually made it something worthwhile? It wasn't the corporations. The corporations may have thrown money at it. Nike may have bought 50 brands, but Nike doesn't give a shit about skateboarding. They care, they care just as much about skateboarding as they do basketball. They don't care. It's all about the bottom line. We make shoes. So when you go take a look at stuff like this, okay, it's not these giant corporations. It's not these BlockFi's and these cash apps that make Bitcoin, okay? Believe it or not, it, it, it's, the, it's the smaller, first of all, it's the individual plebs that believe, in, that believe in Bitcoin, that believe in Bitcoin's future. And to the people who are developing on Bitcoin, them, Okay, the developers that are taking their time and their effort, there is no central Bitcoin Inc. company. Okay, so these people are living, they, they, they are literally living for Bitcoin. And then you have, you know, people, people like Seed Signer, you know, uh, people like CypherSafe, uh, you know, all of these lightning projects, Raspy Blitz. Uh, I'm, I'm totally missing all kinds of projects. And I do apologize because there's so many amazing projects that are out there. And these people are living and breathing Bitcoin. Because why? Because they see something in it that not everyone else sees. So my original point was, was that it's not the corporations that build this shit, okay? It's the plebs that build the grassroots movements. And in order to have these grassroots movements, you need to have hearts and minds. So essentially, the pleb movement came out of um, trolling and clowning the influencers, because the influencers always felt that it's their narrative, but it's not your narrative. You don't own Bitcoin. You're not the face of Bitcoin. Look, we saw what happened with with the uh, um, uh, what's it called, the user activated soft fork, right? Like we we saw what happened with with Bitcoin Cash. Okay, Roger thought he was the face of Bitcoin, and indeed. Indeed, his moniker, Bitcoin Jesus, was fantastic, and, and, and it attracted a lot of people. And certainly, he is a fantastic salesman. But at the end of the day, what did we learn? Bitcoin didn't need him. Bitcoin doesn't need me. Bitcoin doesn't need you. It doesn't need any one of us individually. What it needs is all of us. Okay? That's what it needs. Because... We mine, we validate, we create content, we do all these things. So it doesn't need any single person. And this is the problem. As soon as the ego gets in the way, that's it. You're not here for Bitcoin anymore. You're here for somebody else. And that somebody else is me. <laughs> so. Absolutely. Yeah. Isn't it interesting? I mean, this is the pattern you see with all these uh, influencers. Like more recently, Nick Carter was like, you know, my star is going to rise no matter what. You you guys are not my LPs. I don't care about you. I'm extremely narcissistic and just thinking I I am something. I'm such such a huge, you know, I'm a whale in this in this lake. And uh, I'm like way more important than every, everybody else. I mean, that that's exactly. So, so these guys, you know, after they capture all the airspace, all the, all the uh, you know, uh, thought space maybe, because they get amplified super often, even though a lot of the times what they say is not intelligent at all. I mean, you have to just say, uh, Bitcoin is good. Wake up and say, <laughs> say something it's super true. dumb, uh, worse if you're copying it from someone else. And then you get tons of engagement and people's mind gets blown. Oh my God, such a profound thing. And these guys start believing that they are actually, you know, super smart thought leaders who are extremely important. And everybody else, even though they say the same stuff, somehow they can turn shit into gold. And uh, what they say is, is like really, really something. But all the time I ask myself, you know, what's the substance behind what this guy is saying? And often I see engagement or amplification they receive has 
little to do, very little to do with, with the amount of content that's in there. So that mm. tells me, you know, that that's how I think about the game. It's all a game of, you know, playing with the media. And the problem is these guys believe it at the end and they actually think the conjectures that they pulled out of their ass actually is intelligent commentary that is valuable. And everybody else, why why is it valuable? Because everybody else is retweeting and liking it and getting blown away by it. And, uh, you know, I get uh, my dose of frustration on, on Twitter every day, seeing these kind of stuff. But yeah, uh, the real, real innovation, real movement is happening at the pleb level gra grass root, grassroots. So as we get closer to the end, I don't want to hold you, hold you up a lot, but a lot of uh, people, uh, after we announced that we are going to talk about Bitcoin culture together, uh, we're, we're very excited first, but then also asked about, you know, your future plans and uh, what are you going to do? Are you going to take a fiat job or uh, what other projects are you getting started with? We talked about Pleb Underground. That's one thing that I know, but explain what are you going to do moving forward? Okay, so I, I'm, I've, I've opted out of the fiat job for now. Uh, I'm gonna stick with I, I'm gonna stick with uh, staying in Bitcoin and making Bitcoin content. I, I really enjoy it and I just want to do what I enjoy. Uh, so essentially what happened was was that about two weeks after I, um, I left simply Bitcoin, uh, Pirate was uh, Pirate Beach Bum was mentioning that he wanted to, you know, essentially take his involvement in Bitcoin, like kind of like to the next level, you know, like where he he wanted to start producing regular content. So for the people who don't know, Pirate always produced um, the Bear Market Diaries, okay, which was totally awesome and really helped me through my first bear market. <laughs> it was really amazing to read all those articles and. Um, he also was, and I hope I'm not destroying this, but I, he was an editor for, for Hacker Noon at some point before, before they started with their, their shitcoin antics. Um, so, you know, he really wanted to essentially dive into doing something a little bit more, you know, that, that was more focused, um, I guess you'd say, on the Bitcoin space, but plebs, right? Like pleb Bitcoin content. So he... You know, he explained to me what he wanted to do, and I told him that I was going to do a, a podcast again, right? I was after Simply Bitcoin. I'm going to do another YouTube channel uh, about Bitcoin, of course. And, you know, so then I said, well, hey, you know, if you're interested, I'd like to join you. And he, he honestly said, I, I didn't think that you'd want to do this, you know, because he had the impression that I, I didn't want to do this. And I said, no, I go, I want to do it. I go, I just want to do it under different terms. Um, so... What uh, what ended up happening was was that uh, we agreed and then we started to figure out a name. Uh, so we came up with Pleb Underground and essentially what it is right now is it's a collective. Anybody who wants to produce Bitcoin content and maybe would like to amplify their signal, they can send it to us. Uh, Pirate is gonna you know or myself, but most likely Pirate's gonna create a Substack article out of it and we're gonna tweet it out and help amplify the signal of fellow Pleb content. Be it. Uh, be it stories, be it news, memes, uh, you know, video, audio, we don't, we don't really care. And at the same time, at the same time, I am going to produce a, uh, I'm going to make a YouTube show. We're actually going to be recording this Sunday. Now it's very interesting, but I was going to call it Bitcoin philosophy. Okay. Um, but now that I've seen this background that I have here and it says pleb underground, I, I already wrote to Pirate and I said, dude, I go, we're not calling it Bitcoin philosophy. We're calling it the Pleb Underground YouTube show. Like, that's it. It's I, I think it's the perfect name. I think it looks so I just think it looks dope. So, I agree. Yeah, Sounds this, better. Is, yeah. this is what's going to happen, you know, and, uh, you know, like as of right now, uh, as of right now, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that uh, I, I actually did stack uh, for the last five years. I'm not a LARPer. You know, that, that just sat there and, you know, put screenshots of Bitcoin I never bought, you know, and uh, telling everyone that, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, you got to buy Bitcoin, you know, while I do nothing and not buy Bitcoin. No, I, I literally poured everything I had from my normie job um, into Bitcoin for several years. And so I, I'm, I'm taking a risk, right? So I'm taking a risk. And I want to make Bitcoin content full time. And I want it to be pleb content. And so this is going to be a slow growth. Um, just like it was with simply Bitcoin, 
Uh, you know, simply Bitcoin's the same thing. It's pure pleb content and it's it's slow growth because what people don't understand, okay, what people don't understand about this is that when you are not shilling shit coins, when you are not playing nice with the circle jerkers, they make sure to exclude you. So your signal definitely gets drowned out. But the beauty, the beauty of humans, right? The beauty of us all is that people, you know, real recognizes real. And, and people can spot when someone is being genuine and authentic. So, yeah, you can stifle us for a time, you know, just like Bitcoin, right? You can, you, you, you can stifle Bitcoin for a time, but it doesn't matter. It's just going to churn out another block. And honestly, whether I have a normie job or not, that doesn't stop me from producing content. A lot of people don't know this, but I, I had, a, um, had a podcast before called Fun with Bitcoin. And all I did was interview plebs. I did that for two years before I went to Simply Bitcoin. And I put out an episode every week. Every week I'd put out another episode. So that didn't stop me. It didn't make a difference that I had a normie job, that I was traveling all over the country dealing with database nightmares and all kinds of crap. So why would this stop me now? You know, why would this stop pirates? It wouldn't. So we're just going to continue to do this and we're going to continue to piss people off. And you know what? Fuck them. It really doesn't matter. Because guess what? They're saying fuck you to me too. So, hey, the street goes both ways. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Yeah, I wish you the best. And I look forward Thanks, man. to seeing what you do here. And uh, we will do anything we can to help help you guys and promote what you do. You know, we're, we're very small ourselves. So this was hey, my man, first we all interview. Grew together. Man, so you were fire, man. It was super awesome. Oh. Thank you so much. This was a great this was a great show. I think you're gonna do fantastic. Thank you so much for having me on. And don't forget to check out Pleb Underground. It's at Pleb Underground on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. Uh, I had a I had a blast. So when would people hear about your YouTube content? Ah, okay. So I do have an intro video out there right now, uh, which I will now most likely have to redo since I just rebranded on the spot on your show. Um, but there is a intro video there that's a minute long. And this Sunday, we are recording an episode, myself, Walton, right, from the Bitcoin, uh, from the, uh, the Bitcoin Council of Autism, and Pirate the, Beach uh, Bum. I, I used to call him the buttery voice, Walton. <clears throat> That's awesome. So yeah, it's going to be uh, it's going to be us and uh, we're going to have Pirate Beat Bum on as a guest to talk about uh Pleb Underground, you know, and then give everybody the uh, the scoop on uh, on what's going on. So we're going to record that Sunday. This is the first show I am going to edit, okay? Uh because I did not do any of the editing for Simply Bitcoin, so this is going to be very interesting. Um and hopefully I'm going to have it out at some point next week. Okay, awesome, awesome. Well, I look forward to it. And uh, thanks a lot again. Thank you. Take it easy.